Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Still most comfortable far from cities, he settled in Deerford, which, like many towns in the Deerwood, was beginning the slow process of rebuilding. Believing now that it was the obligation of Kith to be the leaders their gods had not, Adair was soon named mayor of the town, and under his guidance, Deerford soon began to prosper. He expelled the last of the Scanites from the area and drew new settlers with the offer of land, a trick he had learned from someone he otherwise preferred to forget. With each passing day, Deerford would come to more closely resemble the gilded veil of Adair's childhood, the one worthy of its name. Adair chose not to return home to Gilded Vale. Through a number of quiet inquiries, he soon found his way into the underground organization of Aethasians known as the Night Market. Ironically, in learning that the gods had been fabricated, Adair found his faith in Aethas renewed, and that his god was neither alive nor truly a god had become irrelevant. He rose quickly through the ranks of the Night Market for his optimism and for his bold leadership, his ultimate goal to make the Deerwood a place that would welcome followers of the Shining God once again. Adair chose not to return home, still conflicted as to his role in the Saints' War and unsure of his place in the Deerwood, he took a ship to Adir and reunited with his parents. There, he resumed the quiet lifestyle he had grown accustomed to in his years as a farmhand in Gilded Vale. Free from the burden of her memory, Maneha soon left the gift-bearers and resumed adventuring. Now that she had a taste for the world, she wanted to experience it anew. As she traveled and accepted burdens from Andra's supplicants, she saw in their eyes a kind of peace that she had not previously noticed. It was faith, not that Andra had freed them of their pain, guilt, and regret, but that she would, a little more each year. With that realization, Maneha learned to accept that Andra's ways were as gradual as they were inexorable. Once Maneha had made peace with her memory, she decided the time had come to face her more recent past. For the first time in decades, she returned home to Rawatai, and she found that it had changed as much as she had. New districts had sprung up along the coast, while others withered into crumbling husks, and the streets had changed their course as surely as rivers. Her parents wept with joy at her return. They still ran the old spice shop, and in its many aromas and flavors, she found memories of the places she'd traveled and the people she'd known. She told her story, bottle by bottle, and began to build a life on the soil she knew best. Maneha never found the salt well but she found a kind of peace in her duties as a gift-bearer and in the ebb and flow of her journeys. Maneha rediscovered her zest for battle, extravagance, and romance. She kept her gaze on the horizon, looking from one journey to another more distant, from the lover in her arms to another more fervent. Hers was a life of excitement, violence, and passion. She moved too quickly for regret to catch up with her, and she hoped only that she might outpace it in the next life as well. When the dust settled in sun and shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Ix Arcanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong, and he knew what he would do better. The secret of the gods would be preserved, and with it, the sanity and well-being of all kith. He donned the remains of Theos's ceremonial garb and prepared himself for the long and lonely task ahead. When the dust settled in sun and shadow, Aloth looked upon the remains of Theos Ixarchanon, his former master. He saw where the Grand Master had gone wrong and what would be required to undo the harm Theos had wrought. With a flick of his wrist, he burned Theos's robe, headdress, and every other symbol of the man's power. Never again, he vowed, should Kith live in fear and blind obedience to an authority they did not understand. Armed with the knowledge and courage he had gained on his journeys with the Watcher, he set out on the long and lonely task of dismantling the leaden key. After the Watcher sent him away, Aloth found himself cut off from every authority and ally he had ever known, his family, his homeland, the leaden key, and, finally, the Watcher. He wandered on his own for several days, 
passing through villages and settlements. The dear woodens he passed looked on the ragged Adiran with suspicion, and he did not linger long enough to let their misgivings turn to violence. Finally, he passed the last township and reached the wilds of Air Glonfoth, alive with hunter and beast alike. Yet none accosted him, and he eventually found himself among the ruins of the Ingwithans. He found one of the ancient machines easily enough. When he did, he remembered the rituals he had learned from the Watcher. With a final sigh, he activated the device, surrendering his soul to the powers beyond. Zawa came to peace with the end of the Dakan people, and decided instead to start anew. He traveled to Defiance Bay, where he took up residence with the Scriveners of the Hand Occult for a time. He spent his time there writing down everything he could remember of the Takan and their way of life. When he was finished, the voluminous set of tomes was given to the Hall of Revealed Mysteries so that the Takan legacy might live on. Zawa came to believe that the Takan had survived through him. He returned to Ishamadal, where he united a number of small, vulnerable tribes under the beliefs of his people. He called them Takanakin, kin of Takan, and under his tutelage, they became strong enough to resist would-be conquerors. Zawa taught his secrets not to one chosen person, but to all, that the line of knowledge might never be broken. Zawa came to understand that the time of the Takan had passed. With his soul no longer fettered to worldly concerns, he grew to become the enlightened Anitle his shaman had foreseen. He took up in an empty monastery near Cold Flow Lake and word began to spread of his presence there. He taught pilgrims and students how to leave behind their vanity, their fear, and even their past. He invited those who studied with him to share their newfound knowledge, so that all might free themselves from suffering. Zawa came to peace with the loss of his master's knowledge, and decided instead to start anew. He traveled back to Cold Flow Lake, where the Monastery of the Thousand Dreams remained empty. There, he founded a new order with a new philosophy based upon his own experiences and unusual beliefs. Would-be disciples traveled great distances to learn from the old master, and in time, they took disciples of their own. Seeing himself as the last messenger of the teachings of Ishapilo, Zawa sought out an apprentice who embodied the spirit of the Nalpazka. Finding one in a vicious Defiance Bay bar fight, Zawa took her under his wing and taught her everything he remembered learning from his master. He asked her to promise to do the same before sending her onward, and she obliged. Zawa saw that his master's teachings were lost to the world and that he was to blame for it. He began to journey aimlessly, seeking punishment and suffering, craving the moments of clarity they brought him. But they would remain only moments, as true enlightenment continued to elude him. With both their aims fulfilled, Kanarua bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to his beloved Rawatai. There he reported on his findings to the Lore College. Kana spoke of the Ingwithan people, describing both their vile experiments and their inspiring accomplishments. He spoke too of the destruction of the tablet by the Leaden Key and the group's efforts to erase the Angwithan legacy from the world. Both inspiration and cautionary tales, he said, could be found in the world beyond Rawatai's borders. Kana urged his people to continue to pursue knowledge abroad so that the lessons found there might benefit Tekoa. Kana's inability to prove his theory of Angwithan influence diminished his academic standing, but his passion drew much interest from those less concerned with degrees. Kana swiftly became an influential figure in the move toward a more collaborative approach to expansion on the northern continent. In his personal life, he came to enjoy the reputation of an affable eccentric, willing to share grand and impossible secrets along with a drink and a song. With the Watcher's goals accomplished and his own vows fulfilled, Kana Rua sailed back to Tekoa. His friends and family found him much changed, for a pall had fallen upon the man smothering his former enthusiasm. Called before the Lore College, Kana told them of the pain the Angwithan legacy brought to the lands abroad. He insisted that a search for answers abroad could only fragment the Rawatai people, as it had done to the Deerwood. 
His findings were met with much respect, and Kanarua's voice came to be considered an influential one in the growing move towards Rawatai's isolation. With both their aims fulfilled, Kanarua bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to his beloved Rawatai. There, he came before the Lore College, determined to guide his people down a better path. Before his intrigued peers, he spoke of the accomplishments of the great people of Engwith and their efforts to bring peace to Rawatai and the myriad cultures of Aora. He presented the shattered tablet as proof of the Tonvi Oratoa's existence beyond Rawatai's borders and the shared ideals of Aora's peoples. Kana called for a new age in Rawatai culture, where his people might take their place at the forefront of progress and pave the way toward a better future. Kanarua's speech proved inspiring, and his voice came to be considered an influential one in the push toward continued progress in the northern continent. With the Watcher's goals accomplished and his own vows fulfilled, Kanarua sailed back toward Rawatai, thinking on the lessons his travels had provided him. By the time he landed at Tekoa, he understood what his path must be. Standing before the Lore College, Kanarua explained that the tablet he sought had been destroyed, and so a true interpretation of the Tonvi Oratoa could no longer exist. The people of Rawatai would have to create their own. He described the many strange things he had seen in his travels, and announced his intent to pursue the accumulation of knowledge abroad, seeking answers to new questions. True to his word, Kana soon set sail on yet another expedition, and in Tekoa, his passionate accounts inspired many to follow in his footsteps. After parting ways with the Watcher, Kanarua set out once more in search of the Tanvi Oratoa. Gathering up his supplies, he descended into the endless paths of Odd Nua to seek out the Holy Tome on his own, and there vanished. What became of him remains a mystery. After all that he had learned in the Watcher's company, Kanarua could no longer see meaning in his pursuit of the Tanvi Oratoa. He decided to leave what remained of it within the depths of the endless paths and return home. Kana bid the Watcher farewell and sailed back to Rawatai, spending the tempestuous journey reflecting on the time he had lost to the pursuit of falsehoods. His family found Kana much changed, his fiery excitement replaced with a weary solemnity. Determined to change his wandering ways, Kana took up a quiet life as a lorekeeper at the college, teaching young students the traditions of their people. After five years of searching for Persak, Sagani's four-month journey home felt longer still. The Deerwood, Air Glonfoth, the Valian Republics became places on a map, endless expanses of green between her and Nasitok. Her homecoming was celebrated by all of Masuk, yet it was the reunion with Kalu and their children that truly brought her joy. She relinquished her role in the long hunts, and ever after, she and Itumak spent their days working in the village and their nights at her hearth. She watched her own children and their children grow and thrive. When she finally passed, she lay surrounded by the affection and tears of five generations. Sagani experienced the four months of her journey back to Masuk in vivid colors. She strove to memorize every moment of her final trip through the Deerwood, Erglonfoth, the Valian Republics, and beyond, preparing to tell her village of what she had seen on her long journey. All of Masuk shared in her triumph, and she felt her pride and elation magnified by the joy of her village. Never again did she doubt the value of her sacrifices. After decades as a long hunter, Sagani finally became one of Masuk's most respected elders. She guided her community with wise counsel, and a generation after she finally passed, another huntress journeyed into the world to find her soul. In her four-month journey back to Nasitok, Sagani found that the landscape she traveled had become strangely colorless, the food bland and unsatisfying. She watched the Deerwood, Herr Glonfoth, the Valian Republics, and the lands beyond slide by with a dull sense of dread. She returned home to great celebration, yet the words of joy and congratulations rang hollow to her. Old beloved songs sounded toneless. The rituals of changing seasons became drudgery, 
and Sagani experienced her life back in Masuk, as if in someone else's skin. So she fought to feel the worth of her actions, or, at least, to let her village feel them. She led ever longer and more ambitious hunts, mentoring the younger rangers who followed her. On one such expedition, her party was beset by a blizzard, and she pressed on where her companions turned back. She did not return to Masuk. You and Sagani never found Persok together. The Adra figurine had gone dark by the time they emerged from Sun and Shadow, and it was another month before Sagani finally accepted that Persok's trail had gone cold again. Her search took her beyond the Deerwood and as far as the living lands. She saw the great coastal cities of Rawatai and the ruins of Old Velia, absorbing the details of these strange and distant lands. Twenty years passed before the Adra figurine finally glowed again. When it did, she followed its signal to a quiet hamlet on the outskirts of Adir. There she met a young farmer and told her of her past as an elder of Masuk. Sagani returned to a village that had forgotten her face but remembered her story. Masuk greeted her with cautious warmth, and Sagani found that their ways had become strange to her. She also learned that Kalu had perished of winter fever a few years before, and her middle child, Najuo, had died in a raid. But she found her daughter Yakona a hunter and mother of three, and her son Malak a builder of mighty walls. In them, she came to find her place in the village, and the familiar contours of a world that had changed in her absence. Harmka's death had brought the devil of Carrick little satisfaction. In time... Her taste for vengeance soured. What replaced it was a hunger to feel something, anything, new. Summer had thinned the snowpack twice over when she felt the joint at her elbow first begin to stiffen. She turned her back on the hopes of animancy and civilization and walked east. She pushed through the mountains, past Raid Ceres, and into the broad plains of Isha Middle. She had forgotten what it was like to simply journey no goal or destination in mind. Though she felt nothing more than the steady thump of her feet on the road, the endless horizons and grassy meadows were new to her. She measured her time in the gradual rusting of her body and was satisfied. Her movements slowed, but so did the world around her. Waist-high grasses undulated and tacked in the wind, as gradual as the tides. Sparrows and black jays made steady pilgrimages across the sky, each flap of their wings a solemn salute. She could hardly move when she found something she had never seen before, the ocean. With the last of her strength, she pulled herself beneath the water, content at last to feel the movement of currents and the constant caress of the waves. Releasing Harmka left the Devil of Carrick with a gnawing dissatisfaction that continued to eat at her long after the Watcher confronted Theos. She resumed her search for the men and women who had raised Cold Morn, clinging to the hope that enacting her revenge might one day allow her to feel something. Yet, as she hunted and killed, the futility of her actions grew like a leaden weight in her gut. Her movements grew stiff and sluggish as her zeal deserted her. One day, she found herself surrounded in Maiden Falls. As she tried to fight back against the villagers, she felt her arms stick in their sockets, and her legs buckled beneath her. The villagers tore her body apart and shattered its segments while she screamed, feeling none of it. With your business concluded, Heravius quietly took his leave and headed home to Thane Bog. The elders of the Fisher Crane had not warmed to Heravius in his absence, and when he arrived, he was denounced and scorned. Heravius spoke of his deeds and of his communion with Galloway. Yet none would support his petition to return to the tribe. One by one, starting with the oldest, Heravius challenged each member of the council to single combat, humiliating the Riau in a series of savage duels. With half the council bloodied and shamed, the elders at last acknowledged Heravius' strength, announcing him a hunter of the Fisher Crane tribe. Upon being granted this title, Heravius calmly left the village and embarked again on his life of wandering. Heravius took his leave of the party and, after his first bath in years, returned to his nomadic lifestyle. With his homesickness expunged, 
he found renewed joy and tranquility in his wandering survey of the wilderness. For the first time in his life, he ventured beyond sight of the mountains of Er Glonfath. During his travels, he penned numerous journals and sketches detailing his travels through frozen tundra, searing desert, and tropical forests. Wherever he went, Heravius left behind stories of the autumn druid, a temperamental one-eyed wise man of the forest, known to bring food to lost travelers and unusual advice to anyone willing to ask him a question. Durance used Magrin's strength only until Theos had been cast from the world and then swore off her influence entirely. Regret came to weigh heavily on his mind, and a man who had never previously lacked for words or opinions came to embrace silence and contemplation. He continued to wander, penniless and destitute, searching now not for the reason for his goddess's silence, but for a mechanism for revenge. The charred robes he continued to wear as a reminder that he had been burned by his goddess, and not just by the flames of the godhammer. Durance continued to blame Woodica for the atrocities of the Saints' War. Believing Magrin to have been a pawn in the machinations of the queen that was, and feeling that Theos's expulsion had been a step towards reconciliation with his goddess, Durance tried for a time to reopen communication with her. When only silence came, he took it as a condemnation of his continued existence. Ultimately, he built a pyre and threw himself upon it, using his own shattered staff as kindling. With Theos defeated and the souls released from sun in shadow, healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. Pleasant and peaceful memories rose to fill the cracks in the grieving mother's mind. She returned to the birthing bell, unaware that the village nearby had become an empty desolation in her absence. Thus she began her tireless vigil atop the Adra, awaiting mothers and children who never came. With Theos defeated and the souls released from sun and shadow, healthy children were born once again in the Deerwood. The grieving mother sought a place where she might do penance for the birthing bell. She returned to Deerford, where, to the astonishment of the villagers, she delivered the first healthy child in over a decade. She remained there, and with each new birth, she saw a measure of hope restored to the Deerwood and a measure of grace for her own troubled past. Palagina had missed the opportunity to complete her mission from the Duke's bells. With the Deerwood's people strengthened by the Watcher's gift of souls, they quickly resumed brisk trade with the tribes of Er Glanfath. For her repeated insubordination and loss of lucrative trade, Pelagina was cast out of the Brotherhood of Five Sons. She traveled north of the Eastern Reach, where she tried to avoid trouble as a caravan guard, but she could not escape the strange looks and unwanted attention her appearance brought. Pelagina had gone against the Duke's Bell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Anamenfoth to accommodate the recovering Deerwood and Market. With the Deerwood's people strengthened by the Watcher's gift of souls, the Valian Republics found themselves struggling to keep up with their new competitors. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Pelagina was banished from the Republics for several years. After the southern forest of Erglanfoth opened to both the Republics and the Deerwood, the Valians found that the combined efforts of all three nations had created a robust trade network. The Duchessa of Biagepi granted Pelagina a pardon for her foresight, though it took many years for her to regain the trust of her superiors and brothers in the Order. Pelagina had followed her orders from the Duke's Bells, helping establish an exclusive trade arrangement between the Valian Republics and the tribes of Er Glanfath. Strengthened by the Watcher's Gift of Souls, the furious Dear Woodens waged war against the Republics for two long years. The Republics gained a great deal of wealth in trade, but suffered the loss of many trade vessels, and thousands of lives. Several of the ducal families lost favor with their citizens. Riots in Salona claimed the life of that city's duke, and the other duke's bells were pressured into relinquishing their exclusive trade rights to end the conflict with the Deerwood. Pelagina had been honored for her service at the opening of trade, but her reputation among the dukes and within the Brotherhood was not tarnished by what followed. 
Pelagina had gone against the Duke's Bell's orders by inventing a new trade arrangement with the Anamenfath to accommodate the recovering Deerwood and Market. With the Deerwood's people still weakened by Wideman's legacy, the Valian Republics easily pushed their would-be competitors out of the market. For her outrageous insubordination and audacity, Pelagina was banished from the Republics. She traveled north in the Eastern Reach, avoiding Valian ports and entering the ranks of the kind wayfarers. Despite her bravery and dedication to those in her care, her strange appearance made her feel like an outsider wherever she went. Pelagina had followed her orders from the Duke's Bells, helping establish an exclusive trade arrangement between the Valian Republics and the tribes of Er Glanfath. With the Deerwood's people still weakened by Wideman's legacy, the Valian Republics easily pushed their would-be competitors out of the market. The Deerwoods suffered as terribly from the lost trade as the Republics benefited from it. Pelagina was honored for her service by being assigned as the personal guard of the Duchess of Spirento. Despite her success, she regretted the choices she had made along the way. Pelagina had missed the opportunity to complete her mission from the Duke's Bells. The Deerwoods' trade with Er Glanfath remained weak, but the Valian Republics were unable to enter Glenfathen markets. For her repeated insubordination and loss of lucrative trade, Pelagina was cast out of the Brotherhood of Five Sons. She traveled north of the Eastern Reach, where she tried to avoid trouble as a caravan guard, but she could not escape the strange looks and unwanted attention her appearance brought.